this is officially day one of Jacqueline's journey. <laughs> then I looked over and there was Megan Fox and MGK and I was like, what the hell is going on? I like hit this goal that I'm going after. Mm. R13! <sighs> oh my God, I'm so out of breath. <laughs> I'm becoming what I eat. I don't want to wash it. No! It gets so dramatic. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today we'll be tackling a really juicy one. Juicy. Chatting about Jaclyn Hill's new controversial weight loss series. Now, before we get into it, feel free to pause the screen or look at the description to check out my general disclaimer, including a huge trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. As always, please feel free to skip this video if it's not supportive to your journey. And also do not forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on an episode. Now, please note that we do film these videos as well in advance and these are my thoughts only on her first episode so if you want to see more of these definitely tell me below in the comments and I'll continue to follow the series all right let's dive into episode one day one for the next 60 days of me trying to get in shape me trying to feel better trying to have more brain clarity more sharpness okay so these are all really great goals and i do commend jacqueline for making a commitment to herself but why do we always need to put some arbitrary timeline on these things like why aren't we committing to behaviors that we can maintain beyond like a one or two month mark why aren't we doing these things? Because, you know, even those small little day-to-day -day changes will make us feel better tomorrow, next month, next year, and ultimately for life. Ugh. You know what's funny is a lot of people hate the scale. I don't really care because I know that technically I'm overweight. So I'm like, it is what it is. Who cares? I don't really care what it says. I just care about how I look and feel. So there's actually two times in this day that she gets on the scale. And I'm not sure the point in getting on the scale, not once, but twice in a day, if it holds no power in this journey. But I also know that YouTube loves a good before and after weight loss transformation and Unfortunately, numbers do tend to play a central role in this common trope. But anyways, moving on. Honestly, guys, it's uncomfortable. I don't care what anyone says. I put on about 45 pounds in two years and it's not as easy to stand up. It's not as easy to do things. I'm out of breath all the time. And then of course, not to mention my blood work, my blood panel show that I'm very inflamed. As someone with immense thin privilege, I may have no experience navigating life in a larger body, but I can totally appreciate the desire to lose weight, especially in this kind of aesthetic obsessed society. I also have no right to say that being in a smaller body wouldn't physically allow Jacqueline to do more things or to feel better. Like this is her experience, it's her body, not mine. But I do think it's always worth doing some real introspective work to evaluate our true beliefs around why we want to change our body. And I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with having aesthetic goals, but I do think that it's just worth, you know, doing a little bit of that inner work to understand your true motivations and goals. Now, in terms of her blood work, that may be related to her weight, but it also may not. Please know that research suggests that disease markers like blood pressure, blood sugar, heart rate, etc., can actually often decrease after one engages in healthy behaviors, even if those behaviors do not result in weight loss. So this is why I always say that we want to make these healthy behaviors the goal, not necessarily a number on the scale that we may or may not be able to directly control. Anyways, let's see what she's eating. Ah! <laughs> choppy, choppy, choppy. Now avocado. <laughs> Perfection. Squeezy, squeezy. Now for the kale. <laughs> I'm making a mess. And sweetened almond milk. <laughs> Okay, so in the smoothie, we've got banana, apple, cucumber, avocado, kale, and almond milk. And I love me a green smoothie for a quick, light meal. And while this one does have about 400 calories, there isn't any protein here 
to bump up the satiety factor and help stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Now, research suggests that having a high protein breakfast can help to improve appetite regulation and can help curb hunger and cravings later on in the day. So while we do have some fiber and fat and all those fruits and veggies, adding in some like Greek yogurt or silken tofu or protein powder would make this a much more satiating morning meal. Now I'm back and I'm hungry. I don't know if any of you were like this. I feel like I have to like put something in my mouth every hour and a half, whether it's like a handful of almonds or if it's just like carrots. I have to constantly be snacking because I never feel like full. Okay, lots to unpack here. First of all, I would say that the reason why Jacqueline doesn't feel full or satisfied is again, likely because she's just not getting enough protein in that morning meal. So a low protein breakfast, especially one that's digested pretty quickly, like a smoothie, is just not going to be enough to sustain a lot of adults for very long. So it really doesn't surprise me that she's finding herself mindlessly snacking. This is ultimately your body's way of trying to find any little way it can to survive. I'm hungry. Now second, it sounds to me that while Jacqueline thinks she's eating a lot of junk or crap, that she's actually still stuck in scarcity mentality, where essentially she's bouncing between eating clean meals to binging on Doritos midday. So the pendulum is kind of constantly swinging between unsatisfied and bored to overstimulated and stuffed. This doesn't feel good to anyone. And yeah, you probably would unconsciously crave that kind of overfed feeling because you know that the alternative is overt restriction. My suggestion to Jacqueline would be to rework that breakfast meal to get in maybe 20 or so grams of protein and to include foods that we actually enjoy. So we're not kind of unconsciously always chasing that satiety and satisfaction all day long with these little tiny snacks. But for now, I ordered Uber Eats. It's chicken breasts, roasted veggies, avocado. It does have brown rice in it, which I'm trying to stay away from brown rice because not only am I trying to eat clean, I'm trying to stay away from grains. Keep in mind, I'm also doing this to reduce inflammation. Ah, oh, inflammation. One of the most overused, misunderstood words in our wellness culture lexicon. Technically, inflammation is your body's immune response to some kind of stimulus. It's a real thing. And while we do actually need some inflammation in the body to like, you know, elicit an immune response to like stave off infections, low grade chronic inflammation is linked to oxidative stress and therefore chronic disease. Now, in terms of prevention, consuming an excess of high glycemic index refined carbohydrates may contribute more to inflammation through raising blood sugar and insulin levels. But the brown rice in that bowl is actually considered medium on the glycemic index. And research also suggests that dietary patterns with lots of fiber rich carbs, unsaturated fats, omega-3s and antioxidants can actually have anti-inflammatory effects in the body. So unless there's an intolerance to consider, that bowl, including the brown rice, is actually a pretty great anti-inflammatory choice. Honestly, eating just the little bits of ingredients on the top to me is just not enough for a meal. So my recommendation would be to focus on what we can add to a meal to boost the anti-inflammatory properties rather than focus on what we have to always take away. So the avocado, veg, and the chicken definitely help as with things like berries, fatty fish, nuts, seeds, and yes, whole grains. Okay, so now we are at my storage unit. I have an entire storage unit that is filled to the brim of clothes that as I have gained weight, I've like put it all aside thinking like, well, one day when I'm 125 pounds again, I'm gonna want this. And I've come to terms, I'm never going to be 125 pounds, like skinny little no muscle Jacqueline ever again. I don't know who needs to hear this, but it is a normal part of life to see our body shape and size change. I don't want my 19 year old body anymore because for me, that body doesn't have the rich life experience that my larger 33 year old body has. And if smaller clothes just brings on a sense of guilt, shame, and of course, physical discomfort to try to squeeze into, they ultimately serve us zero purpose. Get them out of here. Do not wait to live your best life for when you are fitting back into your high school jeans. So I am happy to see that Jacqueline's willing and ready to let go. I know that that can be really hard. 
the last thing I want to do is work out in any way, shape, or form. I'm actually in a really bad mood. I am really stressed out right now. I'm really annoyed by um, some people in my life right now, my family. I want to get on the couch in my comfy clothes, and I want to eat a bowl of pasta. That's what I want to do, but I'm forcing myself. I got online, and I looked up benefits of a 20-minute walk, and there's so many amazing health benefits, so I'm like, I'm gonna get on the treadmill, even if I'm pissy the entire time, just get a little walk in before I end my day. Oh my God, I have sweat dripping down my chest and back. I'm so out of breath. This and it's not improving my mood. So I do agree that sneaking in a 20 minute walk is a really great way to boost those endorphins. However, it's really not worth punishing yourself over if you're just not enjoying yourself and you're just like waiting for it to be over. If walking is Jacqueline's workout of choice throughout her journey, I'd suggest trying to make it a little more enjoyable or even like therapeutic. So take the dogs for a walk outside in nature, uh, go out with your friends or your partner, add a podcast, music, or your favorite Abby's Kitchen episode. Yeah, I don't know if that's something I wanna do right now. Or if that's not working for you, just try to find a different activity that doesn't totally suck to you. I'm exhausted and I don't know why because I got eight hours of sleep last night, but I'm pretty sure it's because I was dreaming about food all night long. So I had a dream that Kourtney Kardashian invited me over to her house. Travis Barker was there and I began to freak out. Then I looked over and there was Megan Fox and MGK and I was like, what the hell is going on? What, what is my purpose of being here? And then Courtney walked up to me and said, thanks so much for coming to the barbecue. I looked over to my right and I'm not kidding, there was a full on table that was just covered in food. Oh dear. Now I don't think we need to read too much into the occasional food dream, but considering the context, I don't know. I think this could be a sign that she's maybe just not meeting her needs. I saw the signs. All right, so two soft boiled eggs for me. So this is another day's breakfast. But again, like this is just not enough. I am happy that we're at least getting a little bit of protein that maybe we were missing out on with the smoothie, but it is just a really light, unbalanced meal. So she could combine the eggs with day one smoothie or even throw in a piece or two of toast to make this more of a substantial meal. I'm feeling so frustrated right now after doing the measurements. There's something about it that's just very discouraging to me and I don't want it to be discouraging, but it is. So I have a lot of empathy for Jacqueline because I think I can hear her trying to reject society's fat phobic mindset and kind of position it as, you know, how she feels in clothes. But I guess I would still want her to do a little more work to ask herself why feeling her body in fitted clothes makes her feel gross. Ew, David! This sentiment is steeped so deeply in diet culture, we usually don't even question it. But why is it so gross for our clothing to, you know, like highlight the shadow of our fat? Why is it so close for our legs to touch? You know, I'm not shaming Jacqueline for saying these things. Again, I don't think it's her fault for having these self beliefs, but I think it's worth her getting uncomfortable and doing some work here work, to ask herself why she feels this way. And a therapist would be a really great support in this case. And if she is physically uncomfortable in her her clothes, then again, this is a really great reason to clear out the closet. But what sucks is that when I get like stressed about something or bothered or annoyed, one of the first things I want to do is just like eat comfort food. So I want everyone to know that it's totally normal to derive comfort from food. This is healthy, normal behavior, but it can become unhealthy when we're relying on food as our only coping mechanism. Now, the first step is to build awareness of when you're using food to cope with negative emotions, which it does sound like Jacqueline here is doing. But being harder on herself to cut cravings is absolutely not the next step. If anything, it's likely just to set her up for a binge. What I would actually encourage is more compassion and patience as she finds some new non-food coping strategies. Punishing herself for giving into a mac and cheese craving by restricting further will only set her up for another binge and emotional eating episode. But managing the negative emotions themselves through effective strategies like therapy, meditation, talking to a friend, journaling, and other acts of self-care may help to mitigate the root cause of the emotional eating. If you want some more tips on emotional eating, definitely check out my video right here. 
that's where I'm at on day two, I'm feeling discouraged just because of the fact that I thought that I was gonna be able to hang on a lot longer than this. Now, the fact that Jacqueline is drastically cutting back on so many things in one go tells me that her cravings may not just be rooted in emotional hunger, but also like primal physical hunger as well. The girl's only eaten two eggs that day. I mean, what more can you expect from the body? So to me, the solution is not to hang on longer or improve her willpower, it's to feed your body enough fuel that it can trust that it's not going to, you know, starve so it can stop obsessively thinking about how to get more food. The chicken salad that I had earlier really helped, really held me over and I felt good after I ate it because I ate it with tomatoes and a bunch of lettuce. In the chicken salad here, we're getting some protein from the chicken. We've got some veggie action, hopefully some kind of healthy fat in there from maybe an oil-based dressing or even some mayo. It's hard to tell, but regardless, this chicken salad meal, still super low calorie. And again, likely just not enough to hold her over for very long. I'd wanna see her add in some high fiber bread, crackers, fruit, uh, maybe some fat from avocado or nuts. And for goodness sake, to make sure that there's enough flavor and fun to elicit some emotional satisfaction as well. Day three, and I'm feeling discouraged. <laughs> You know what? Okay, here's the deal. This is what happened, okay? I decided to weigh myself this morning. I've been eating so clean. What, what's the scale gonna say? And it said that I gained two pounds and 0.4% body fat. Here's the issue with crash diets like this. They put you in this mindset that dramatic restriction and misery will result in dramatic results fast. I mean, how could they not when you've sacrificed so much? The reality is that weight loss is more of a marathon than a sprint. <laughs> That fettuccine was sitting in my stomach like a rock. Not to mention, the scale is also not the best judge of progress since there are just so many factors that can cause daily fluctuations in weight. Things like menstruation, medication, food and drink intake, bowel habits, hormones, sleep, and stress. Why torture yourself unnecessarily by weighing yourself every day when it's not even going to tell you anything reliable about your progress? I mean, so much for the girl saying that she didn't even care about the number on the scale. It's, it's lunchtime, I'm here at the office. Still have a meal prep, so eating chicken pilard, literally just like flat and chicken with arugula, with olive oil, <laughs> and it sounds good. Is it just me or is this girl just exclusively allowing herself to eat chicken and some kind of variation of vegetables. And that's fine if she truly enjoys it, but it's pretty obvious just by her attitude that these meals are not sparking joy. And that to me is really the fastest route to throwing in the towel on any health promoting behaviors. <sighs> I'm feeling good. I'm feeling great. Like I have good energy. I know it's only been like t technically four days, but I genuinely feel like my brain is more clear. Well, I am so happy to hear that Jacqueline is starting to get to a place where she feels good and has more energy. Now it's possible that she's sleeping better or feeling more clear headed from just, you know, having fewer refined carbohydrates or caffeine in the diet, or it's possibly a bit of a placebo effect. We really, can't know for sure. But usually this honeymoon dieting period is typically interrupted by your body freaking out because it realizes, holy shit, I need more food. Making me a breakfast sandwich. It's like two o'clock in the afternoon and I'm just eating breakfast for the first time. I've just drank water all day. Ezekiel English muffin with some sort of like sausage oh, yeah. patty, an egg and a slice of cheddar cheese. That was the best breakfast I have had <laughs> the entire week. It completely changed my mood and I am so happy. And for the first time, I feel like my stomach is like, mm. Yeah, that's what carbs do. That is what food you enjoy does. Yes, I love this meal and I agree. It is the best breakfast she's had all week. Even if she did literally fast all day and just drink water to be able to eat that small sausage breakfast sandwich. What was the thing uh, you needed me to come in early for? Um, the sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit. 
But despite it being, again, a very low calorie meal, especially for one that is eaten after such a long fast, we do at least have some balance going on. So we've got protein and fat from the sausage, egg and cheese, plus some carbs from the English muffin. Now she later comments that this meal was not only filling and put her in a really good mood, but allowed her to make good food decisions later on. So this is the benefit of having meals that are physically and emotionally satisfying. Ultimately, there's just less desire to binge later on when we actually enjoy the food that we eat. I really do hope that she eats more meals like this in the days and weeks to come. I am making a TikTok recipe. It's cucumbers, soy sauce, garlic, chili oil, but we're using chili garlic sauce, honey, sesame seeds, and apple cider apple vinegar. vinegar. Oh. Okay, well, I thought we were headed in the right direction. But alas, now we've got like a mountain of cucumbers. So I do hope that this was just like a snack and not a full meal, but we haven't seen any other meals for that day. So we can only hope. But we've got a little bit of healthy fats in here from the sesame seeds and oil. I would love to see this bulked up with maybe some carbs and protein if she did want to transform it into an actual meal. So maybe throw in some canned chickpeas or serve it with some hummus and crackers for a really simple light lunch. Now with all of that said, where are we nutritionally with Jacqueline's diet? Well, I gotta say friends, not good, not good at all. I am hoping, praying that Jacqueline did in fact eat more than what she showed in this video here each day, because if not, she's racking in about 550 calories per day, which is roughly the caloric requirement of a single meal and pretty much like less than half of what my toddler would eat in a day. So not only is this like a quarter of her caloric needs for the day, but it also means that she's quite low on protein, fiber, carbs, omegas, iron, calcium, potassium, vitamin C, pretty much everything. Even if I were to give Jacqueline the benefit of the doubt that there is another meal in there that maybe she's not showing each day, the meals that she is showing are just not enough. Two eggs, that's not a meal. A little bit of chicken with some arugula, that's not enough. Eating the top ingredients off of a Buddha bowl so that you don't have to eat the rice, not enough. It ultimately sounds to me like Jacqueline is going from zero to 100 with little to no guidance. And this all or nothing mentality to eat less and eat clean all while sacrificing any sliver of joy or fulfillment in the process is going to very quickly burn her out. And honestly, burning out and throwing in the towel is probably the best case scenario here as I would way rather see her just like tap out before it does any serious long-term metabolic harm. Now I could sit here and micromanage every meal, but I really would suggest that Jacqueline seeks out some professional one-on-one -on -one help, not only to help her unpack her emotional relationship with food, but also to help her find a pattern of eating that feels more structured, balanced, varied, satisfying, and doesn't leave her feeling deprived and miserable. I guess we'll just have to stay tuned as we follow along on her journey. So on that note, that is all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if you'd like to see some more commentary on Jacqueline's series. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye!